Well, hello, hello, and welcome to yet another exciting episode of Skeptics and Seekers. I'm your host, David the Skeptic, and we are joined by a plethora, perhaps a multitude, of special guests today. This is part seven of a five-part series on morality. Yes, it was originally going to be a five-part series. It developed a life of its own. And now it's a seven-part series. I am taking control of this thing again, and this is going to be the last one. I swear it. This is it. Uh, And so what gets left on the cutting room floor gets left on the cutting room floor. After this show, I plan to take off for about a month because I am sick of podcasting right now. I am sick of it. This is my off-season. My off-season, people. Anyway. Uh, Part seven. This is the finale. It's going to be great. Uh, And so I will introduce uh, our guests as we go. I'm just going to kick this thing off with my good friend and special guest, Randall Rouser. Randall, how are you doing? I'm doing great, David. How are you doing? I mean, apart from being exhausted and burnt out. Uh, Exhausted and burnt out is right. I don't know if you ever get exhausted and burnt out. You write a lot of books, Randall. Do you ever finish a book and say, this is it for me? I'm done. (laughs) I said that three years ago, and then I uh, ended up writing another one. But that was the – so I'll never say never from now on. Got it. Who knows? <laughs> so, yeah, uh, guys, uh, I love this stuff. Uh, I know that Randall loves what he does, but uh, we get tired. <laughs> so um, I'm looking forward to this show. I hope it's going to be great. Randall, thank you for helping me close out uh, this series on morality uh, you've got a very interesting uh, book, speaking of books, uh, that's out right now. Uh, I have seen it with my own eyes. I am about halfway through reading it. It's very interesting. Tell us what it is. It is called Conversations with My Inner Atheist, and it is an exploration of the kinds of questions that keep Christians up at night, and so, in particular myself, questions that I've wrestled with. So I have an interior, interior monologue with myself, and I put it into a book. So this is a, a very provocative title. What what made you uh, create a title like that? Because I like to be provocative. <laughs> because I think I grew up in a tradition where you're not supposed to have an inner atheist, where you're supposed to have all of your convictions worked out. You're supposed to be certain of everything. You've got all your theological ducks in a row. And the older I've gotten, the more I realize there are certain issues that are very complicated And it is very natural and indeed healthy to be thinking through, wrestling with, and questioning those topics. And so over the last 30 years or so, I've come to terms with having an inner atheist. In fact, rather than learning to live with my inner atheist, I would say that she has spurned me on to a deeper faith, but also one that's a a little bit more modest and chastened in some respects. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Look, it's it's an enjoyable read. I, uh, I like the... Uh, mechanism that you've used and so it's it's very uh, readable it's very approachable Uh, one of the things I like about uh, your books Randall is even though you are uh, a theological professor you uh, write uh, in in a way that's very approachable uh, for the average person and so I don't feel like I've got to consult uh, a stack of a stack of Bible dictionaries uh, before I read one of your books You know, it's always this important thing. Can you take some complicated or sophisticated ideas, but can you make them accessible to a wider audience? And if you can't, you sometimes have to question how well you understand those ideas, because I think that is the best example of a mastery of a concept, is if you can break it down into its more basic parts and then make it accessible to other people yeah and i you don't dumb it down so you need, don't please don't take uh, mistake what i'm saying there's nothing dumbed down about randall's writing it's just uh, approachable and the, the concepts are uh, up there you know they're fairly high concepts but he says it in a way that you know i think any any average eighth grader could follow uh what he's saying and so i I've read a lot of books by a lot of uh, really smart people, and they they show you just how smart they are <laughs> when they when they write. And you scratch your head, thinking, "What it, what was that?" <laughs> and you never you never have to reread one of Randall's paragraphs, saying, "What well, what do you say?" <laughs> so I uh, I just want to uh, say thank you for that style. I appreciate it, and it makes it um, uh, more pleasurable uh, for me to read. 
So, Randall, we've been we've been talking morality uh, lately. I know that you haven't uh, been a part of this discussion, but uh, before I let you go, and by the, by the way, people, it's not he's not getting away that easy. We're going to open season three with uh, Randall uh, Rouser in a uh, full discussion uh, on his book. I just want a chance to uh, rest up a bit, read it a couple of times, uh, and to get my bearings because it is a, a, a very interesting book. And so we're gonna we're gonna deep dive into that. Uh, but I want to bring you into this morality uh, conversation before I let you go, Randall. Uh, and so the thing that I think uh, our six parts before this one has missed, uh, there are a couple of things, actually. But the thing I want to throw at you is uh, applied morality, uh, so the, uh, applied ethics. Uh, I'm not interested so much in the uh, the moral theories. They don't really mean anything to me unless – uh, you can apply them and come up with uh, some kind of moral solution to a moral conundrum that you're facing. And so I'm just going to ask everybody who uh, shows up today uh, how they would deal with this particular situation. And I, I didn't want to make it too difficult. I wanted to make it something uh, easy and approachable and also something that I face uh, every day of my life uh, that I leave the house. Because I live... Uh, in uh, New Jersey, I'm, I'm in New York, uh, uh, you know, two or three times a week. And so this is the situation that I want to give you, uh, Randall. So uh, you get off the uh, commuter train uh, in Central Station and uh, – I'm sorry, Central uh, – at um, uh, Penn Station. Uh, and you uh, come up uh, from the, the tunnel and uh, you go outside and you're on, um, you're on 7th and um, – 30, 30 second, and uh, before you can reach 30 second, before you can get to the corner, uh, there is at least one person asking you for money, uh, and, and it, they're there every day, um, and you'll probably pass uh, two or three uh, before you get to your destination, whatever your destination is. Do you give them money, which is A, uh, B, uh, because you take this route every day, because you're going to work, do you give them money every day? Uh, C, uh, because you go there and come home. Do you give them money every day, every time you pass them? Uh, and then the last part of that is, well, how much money do you give them? D is there anything in your moral system that helps you answer that question? Uh, and if so, I just, I just want us to show our work a little bit. What is it about your moral theory that gets you to an answer to that question? And I'm curious what your answer is. Yeah. Can I just ask how long do I have? Two minutes, three minutes, or what? Oh, about 35 seconds. Uh, you can have as long as you want, Randall. <laughs> All right. Because, you know, professors, I lecture in three-hour blocks, so I can go on, but I, I know we want to be concise. Uh, so first of all, I would say that in this kind of issue, first of all, there's no right answer. There's no one right answer that we need to get at. But I think the first thing that we need to consider, each one of us, is that we see people in our midst who are in need. There was an, an interesting program that was, uh, I think it was like Dateline NBC or one of those shows, where they had people dress up as homeless, where they knew that their family members walked along that sidewalk every day. And in each case, the family members walked right by their own family member they lived with, who was dressed up as a homeless person sitting on the sidewalk. They didn't even look at them or acknowledge them. The first point, I think that that's a real indictment, that we, we want to be blind to people in need in our midst. And so while I understand how people can get into that mindset, I think that's the starting point, is to acknowledge people in our midst. Now, how does, how does my work come through to lead me to that? Well, I am committed to the principle that we should always look at people as ends rather than means. You could justify that through a deontological Kantian framework, but I... Uh, grounded in my Judeo-Christian commitments that I believe Jesus taught us that we should love our neighbors as ourselves, and our neighbors are the members of the outgroup, uh, the people that we usually wouldn't hang out with, and certainly that could be a homeless person. Uh, so that would be the starting point. Now, what is that going to mean every day? It could mean developing relationships with those people. I don't think it gives a simple response of giving them money for the clear reasons that have been established that that can often perpetuate cycles of abuse, but it could mean taking the time maybe once a month, once a week to have a coffee with them, maybe to buy them a meal. And in the other days, just to say hello and get to know them and treat them as ends rather than means, see our neighbor, uh, see ourselves in our neighbor. So that would be my answer. 
Okay, very good. I appreciate that. Uh, and, um, you know, the next time we talk, we might go a little bit further into that because I, I have uh, some similar ideas about that. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Randall Rouser. Randall, thank you so much for stopping by. And um, we are going to move on to introducing a couple of uh, the other people on the, uh, the panel. All right. Thanks a lot. Take care, David, and everyone else. All right. Uh, so, in the, care, ring, in the ring today, uh, we've got... Brian Pointer. Bri Never mind all that. We have Brian with a Y. And we have... David. Yes. I was just going to say, David, if you're going to have me on the show, you got to either pronounce my name right or don't pronounce it at all. Okay. Uh, in, in, okay. I, I won't pronounce it all. We have Mr. Pointier. Um, it is with a, it's with a Y, my last. <laughs> it is with a Y. I thought this was clear. This is... <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm glad I can get you to laugh right out the gate. This is going to be a good night. This is going to be a good show. People. It's going to be a long night. <laughs> we've got, we've got, and we've got Marvin, uh, the man, uh, the man who started this thing with me uh, a few weeks ago now. Uh, so welcome back, uh, Marvin, uh, and thanks for coming in to close this out. Uh, Marvin and Brian are going to be um, uh, kind of wrapping it up for us and Marvin Marvin has a little bit of a, a deadline and so I'm going to try to uh, recognize that but we've, we've got to roll some other stuff in uh, as we go so I'm going to uh, ask uh, Marvin and Brian to put themselves back on mute uh, I know that Marvin never took himself off, out of mute but he's there uh, I, I promise he's ready uh, we are going to bring on uh, back by popular demand uh, Dale and Val, uh, because they had a conversation that uh, kind of kicked this uh, extended series off. And their conversation was, I think it was the longest of the conversations that we had, or close to it. Um, and they got the least in. <laughs> and so they were dealing with some uh, pretty, pretty heavy philosophical stuff about, um, uh, about uh, moral ontology. And uh, interestingly enough, they were both wrong. Uh, and so, uh, and, and furthermore, Val didn't get a chance to complete uh, his, he didn't really even get a chance to so much go into his uh, moral philosophy, as it were. Um, and so I want to uh, bring them back, uh, and we're going to give them a few minutes to uh, kind of wrap that conversation up, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dale and okay. Val. Okay. Uh, Dale, can you hear me? Yep, I can hear you there, Val. You're you're a bit uh, faint. A bit faint. Okay. Can you hear me any better now? Yeah. It's okay. better now. I'm I'm not the fussy one. Dave, David's usually the quality uh, police. Can, can you hear me now, guys? Yeah. Okay. There we go. All right. Cool. Uh, so so yeah so. Um, believe it or not, I, I was telling Val and, and David behind the scenes I, that I'm kind of oversaturated with doing the, the moral shows, but um, because David Russell wanted to do the, the Christian follow-up show, I, I figure, well, if I'm, if I'm doing the work to research and prep for that show, then I'm going to reach out to Val and, and do him the favor, because I know that you sort of, you are sort of bummed that you didn't get to express okay, well, hey, I'm a desire utilitarian. Let me express my view and maybe quickly have Dale kind of give some probing questions and that sort of thing. So, yeah, I, I reached out and Val was kind enough to say, yeah, let's let's do it. So uh, round two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it. I guess the first thing to do is I can turn it to you. And why don't you give the audience what – what is Val's view of, of normative ethical theory? What is this desire utilitarianism that you were mentioning? Oh, boy. Okay. Uh, well, um, I guess as, as, uh, as I mentioned last time, uh, that uh, I guess the, the sort of the big prize, if, if somebody's trying to put forth a um, uh, moral realist, realism theory, um, and an, or a one of objective morality um, that you can um, start with an axiom that you define, whether it's Sam Harris's or anybody else's, 
And from that, you can derive uh, objective, objective facts about what will fulfill whatever you've made your axiom, uh, which seems to be a sort of trivial way to get objective morality, uh, where the big prize is going to be where the, the basis itself or the axiom is itself objective um, and not simply based on opinion or whim. You can have an opinion about it, but you can be wrong or right, and it's not just based on whim. So uh, what I found intriguing about, uh, and I'm sort of squeamish about presenting uh, anything uh, about this theory just because it's certainly not mine. It's by Alonzo Fife. And, uh, and I first encountered uh, Alonzo Fife's um, uh, desirism. It used to be called desire utilitarianism, but it's now called desirism for various reasons. Uh, back in the 90s, uh, I think I first uh, encountered him when we were posting on the uh, Internet Infidel boards. And so I followed, uh, followed uh, he was saying lots of things that were really making sense and getting around interesting problems in, in, in grounding morality. Um, and I found it really hard to deny the initial ontological moves of the theory. And I still do, even though I can't say whether it cashes out all the way down the line. I don't, I'm not sure I've encountered any theory which doesn't ultimately encounter objections, but some seem to me to get off running better than others. So in this case, uh, uh, I will sort of do my best to sort of recollect and represent a bit of uh, desirism um, which some of it might be bastardized with my own uh, thoughts and misunderstandings. So I would actually recommend anybody, um, even just to type in Alonzo Fife, uh, Desires in Google, and you'll find like a, a extensive defenses of the idea there and see where I've gotten things wrong or otherwise. Anyway, so, um, so if we talk about uh, morality, <clears throat> this morality can be expressed, and by the way, jump in any time here to stop me flattering. I'll try and be as fast as possible. So morality can be expressed as being concerned with moral conduct, understanding on what basis we can say actions are right and wrong, good or bad. Uh, it's asking what we ought to do and on what basis. Uh, and ought, as the saying goes, implies can, and can is about taking action. So ultimately, morality uh, seems to be about reasons for actions. And you can see this, um, you can see this all the time when people are discussing morality. Uh, as I mentioned in the previous podcast, even when Christians are debating atheists, and you think there'd be a big divide about morality there, even then, uh, it's very typical for Christian to say, okay, if there is no God on which morality is based, why shouldn't I just steal your stuff if I want to? Or why shouldn't I just rape? Or why shouldn't I just tell lies about kind of stuff like that? So note how this natural default move expresses that at bottom, in morality, we're asking what reasons can be given for doing X or Y action. Uh, so to say you ought to do X uh, seems to be a claim that some reason exists for you to take action X. And that leads to the question, what reasons, if any, exist for actions? So uh, I gave the example on the last uh, podcast about um, purpose and how purpose arises and how uh, once again, even if you've got a divide between Christians and, say, naturalists, um, even Christians will say that for the universe to have had purpose, um, it would take um, a cause that was an agent, and that agent must have, uh, the, the, the purpose will arise from desires and beliefs, uh, rational faculties to derive implications from the combination of desires and beliefs to form an intentional action, and hence that action has purpose. So, you know, God would have wanted to create the universe uh, or wanted to create mankind, uh, had the belief that doing X would create mankind, for instance, speaking the universe into, into existence, and therefore uh, his rationality derives the implication, this is the action he ought to take or should take. But anyways, that's, that's how uh, purpose arises. And, and how do we get this notion? Well, we get it from human humans, uh, because that's how we see purposeful action arise in humans. Uh, it helps us understand, explain, and predict our own actions. So if I'm given a choice on a menu for a meat-based dish or a vegetable-based dish at a restaurant, I choose the vegetable dish, you can ask for what reasons, you can ask the reasons for my action. The reason might be, I have the desire to eat healthy foods. I believe that the vegetable dish is a healthy food choice. And my faculty of reason and logic draws the inference between my desire and belief 
that choosing the vegetable dish will be such as to fulfill my desire to eat healthy, which justifies my intentional action to order the veggie dish. So my desires combined with my beliefs are the proximate causes of my intentional action. Um, this not, ex not only explains action, it shows how prescription basically naturally arises and, as well as predicting my future actions. Um, so what are desires? Um, desires and beliefs can be, if you, if you look at the nature of that desires and beliefs, um, they can be understood as being propositional attitudes. And propositions are the meaning content, content of sentences. So, for instance, my house is blue, and in Spanish, mi casa es azul, uh, use different words, but they express the same meaning content, the same proposition. So, back to beliefs and desires as propositional attitudes. So, for instance, if I have the belief that my house is blue, then I have the mental attitude that the proposition, my house is blue, is true. If I have the desire that my house is blue, I have the mental attitude that the proposition, my house is blue, is to be made or kept true. That is, if my house is white, my mental attitude is that it is to be made blue, say, by painting it blue. So that will uh, invoke my action to paint it blue. If it's already blue, then I have the mental attitude that it's to be kept blue, and I have reason to take any action to resist somebody painting it, say, white. So my, my desire, uh, if it's still blue, my desire is currently satisfied. So uh, I'm going to try and skip some stuff here so I can go faster. Um, so uh, I, one thing to notice here is that the relationship between desires um, and mental uh, attitudes is that it's a relationship between uh, the rela a desire can only be fulfilled by true states of affairs. Um, because a desire being the mental attitude that a certain proposition is true, uh, the desire can only be fulfilled if that proposition is true. So uh, my desire that my house is blue is only fulfilled by my house actually being painted blue. Um, and you can see how this actually accounts for how we actually tend to think about um, the relationship between our desires and truth. So if, for instance, you have, I'll just finish with this and you can ask me more questions. Uh, so for instance, if you have a scenario of uh, you want to give to a charity, there is a specific uh, uh, there's a specific family, say, that are uh, starving, uh, say, someplace in Africa, and you want to help that family. You're giving a charity, and the idea is that you send the money to that family. It uh, helps them, and they send letters back saying how they're doing uh, based on your uh, the money you're sending them. Now, there are two options. Number one, uh, you are actually sending money. It's true that you're sending money. It's true that the family's receiving money. It's true that the money is helping the family, helping their well-being. That fulfills your desire. There's another option. It's a scam. You're sending money, but you're sending it to scammers who are keeping it from the family, and the scammers are writing the letters back to you saying, as if they were from the family, uh, tricking you into thinking that the family saying, oh, thank you so much, and, and we're doing better. Um, every, both of those result in the same mental state of being sort of satisfied, thinking your desire is fulfilled, but we would all... Pretty much everyone would only choose one of those uh, scenarios. That is the scenario where the desires are actually being fulfilled. That is that is where the proposition "I'm helping the family" is actually true, and and that sort of gets at the bottom of uh, it. Explicates how we tend to think about our desires and actions and the relationship of truth uh, to desires and actions. Uh, I can get to other stuff uh, in a moment, but I figure I've talked enough. Oh, all right. So, they, so desires provide the reasons for actions uh, that exist. Let, let me ju uh, just jump in uh, with a quick question, Val. It, now, you mentioned that this was not your view, that you were borrowing it from someone else, but is this a view that you were championing? Uh, is, is I would say, okay. yeah, yeah, I would say it's, it's, I would say it's the one that I find the most compelling at this point. Okay, go ahead. Awesome. All right, yeah, thank, thank you very much for that, Val. Um, all right, so... I get your picture. So desire utilitarianism, it's a version of subjective preference utilitarianism there. So the unit, the, in terms of the theory of value, what, what the beneficial consequence that's creating this uh, hypothetical ought, right, to, to get is desire fulfillment. Um, and just, is there, I just want to clarify, and there, there's a qualification there. So it's a, a reasonable 
desire fulfillment, right? Like you, you wouldn't say, well, if I have a desire to be a pedophile, hey, I, I can reason and fulfill that through means to ends reasoning or something. That is there a qualification on the desires that uh, define moral versus immoral there? Uh, sorry, actually, we dropped out, but I just heard the very end of there, but I'm anticipating the question, so I'm pretty sure I know what it is. That is, what I've described so far is only in the realm of what uh, Kant would uh, call hypothetical odds, prudential odds, practical odds, that kind of stuff like that, um, at which most of us don't think of as being in the realm of morality. Um, and also, uh, the first, because I have not got to the moral part of the theory, and so um, the first thing that would come to anybody's mind with what I've said so far is that, well, uh, morality can't be based on desires because look at all the awful desires that we can point to and we don't say those are moral. So uh, so that's that, I presume, is what your example uh, is trying to bring up. So, yeah. So so what uh, so how do we get to the more the moral part? from the regular hypothetical imperative. So the theory says that there is no categorical imperative in the sense that Kant or a deontologist would say. There are only, those don't exist, there are only hypothetical imperatives uh, of the type that we already recognize in our having desires fulfilled and goals and that kind of stuff. Um, however, uh, so for any action we can take, we can ask, um, will it be such as to fulfill the desire? So it's desire fulfillment that gives something value and gives you the reason to do it. I think, as it turns out, you can ask, you can turn this question on desires themselves, uh, because some, actually many of our desires, uh, are malleable. Um, subject to influence, uh, subject to being encouraged and discouraged. Um, and so you can ask, do I have uh, reasons to encourage, or do we have reasons to encourage certain desires, or reasons to discourage certain desires? And what, what reasons you would have uh, would have to boil down to on this theory, whether it would be such as to fulfill desires. So on desirism, desirism, sort of hypothetical good is such as to fulfill the desires in question. And a moral good is such as to fulfill desires that tend to fulfill other desires. So uh, desires, desirism is concerned centrally with what an agent ought to desire. In fact, it says that that's a central question of morality. Good desires are uh, the desires that people generally have reason to promote universally which means that they are desires that tend to fulfill other desires regardless of whose they are. Um, and uh, our tools for promoting or discouraging desires uh, are things like praise, condemnation, reward, and punishment for, for influencing those desires. So, uh, yeah, if you, if, if you ask which desires we have reasons to uh, promote or, or discourage, uh, you would look to our other desires and uh, see which ones tend to be desire-fulfilling and desire thwarting. So I can give an example of that if we if we just use it a practical example of uh, rape. So do we have uh, uh, do we have reasons to promote or thwart the <coughs> desires in rape in society? Well, rape is inherently a desire thwarting desire, uh, sort of built into it as it were, because to rape somebody is basically to rape somebody against their desire, uh, and they they wish not to be uh, to have sex with you. So you can ask the question this way, if there were no desire to rape, would a society have reasons to invent it and encourage it? Um, and you can think of it this way. What if you had a knob which turned up the desire, to, the prevalence and the strength of the desire to rape in a society? The more you turn it to the right, that desire and prevalence of, of, of wanting to rape in a society is increased the more you turn it down, the desire uh, decreases till zero. What reason would society have for increasing the desire to rape uh, in society? Well, it would certainly uh, objectively uh, increase the, uh, num the amount of desire thwarting in society by all those who don't want to be raped. It would even, <laughs> to some degree, increase the desire thwarting of those who want to rape who don't always have the, uh, the option for raping. 
uh, or can rate. So the more you increase the knob of, of desired rape in society, the more desire reporting there is, hence a bad uh, desire. Uh, so you have more and stronger reasons to decrease the knob where desire thwarting uh, would decrease. Uh, a desire that you would have uh, reasons to promote as a good desire would be a desire fulfilling desire in its place. So for instance, the desire that sex be consensual, uh, you might uh, put some other addendums in there as far as how a society might think it best, but, but to the degree you turn... Sorry, we just uh, lost Val a little bit there. Uh, Dale, go ahead and start filling in the... Increasing uh, the desire that sex ought to be consensual. So if you just look at how those will work out, you'll see that some are objectively desire-fulfilling desires, some are objective, objectively uh, desire-thwarting desires. Okay, I'm, okay. I'm just going to step in. Uh, you guys, um, you've uh, technically got about uh, six minutes left. Uh, All right, so I'm... Uh, okay, great. So, so just to summarize quick, because I've got questions that I want to get to Val that I prepared and I didn't know his view in advance but yes so Val from what I understand Val his unit of utility the, this beneficial consequence that distinguishes things is desire is fulfill, des, fulfilling your desires but there's a qualification there there you you have to fulfill desires that uh, enable other desire fulfillment whereas if you fulfill a desire that will inhibit you from fulfilling your other desires. That's bad. That that's my understanding of what Val said there. Um, okay, so I, I'm gonna have to skip that. You, okay, just just quickly, Val, are, are you? Would you say you're a com? I've got six minutes. You're a combination relative. Well, let, let so, me let me just step in. Real, know, the, let me step in real I quick. I kind of differentiated between a formal moral principle and a material moral principle. So that the desire fulfillment, that's the relative. Part. Let me let me step in just real quick. If uh, so, you will get some more time right now. But if you guys want to wait around until after the show is over, I will let you continue to complete this, and I will shoehorn uh, that part in so that it it doesn't seem like there was a break in it at all. It's just that oh, I've got to respect uh, Marvin's yeah. uh, a hard stop time, and so I want to make sure that he has uh, uh, some time. Okay, and when so, does, when yeah, would Marvin yeah. finish? Uh, Marvin uh, gave us two hours, and so he and Brian are going to get about an hour, <laughs> and so um, before he has to go. So if if you guys want to uh, hang out and then finish your conversation after that, you can. But I will let you go for a little bit longer now. I'll leave it to you, Dale. We want. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah. So I'll, okay, I'll, I'll just ask Lee. Um, so so these are sort of general. Ob objections um, to utilitarianism, and I can apply to yours. So there's this in philosophy. There's what's called the no rest objection, right? Because you're basing it on these. Our, our moral judgments are solely based on these long-term judgments. You know, how how is my fulfillment of this desire going to impact on all my future desires? But pr presumably, you mean long-term, right? It's it's not just over five five minutes uh it's over their whole life like all of my desires in total um so the there's this objection that philosophers give there's no rest you're, you're constantly it, it's practically impossible unless you're omniscient to to enact this kind of morality um so that's that's one objection there um and i'll give i'll give the the three objections and then you can respond to all at once and we'll be done um there's also the thing with utilitarianism where it makes uh, seemingly trivial uh, tasks like, okay, well, what what breakfast should I desire to eat today or something like that, this or that, and you've got to make these long-term calculations, and it, it makes everything, even trivial decisions like what do I eat Frosted Flakes or Shreddies for breakfast today, a moral decision when that's not moral. Um, and then the third objection is with regard to S David's interesting question to Randall Rouser, super, sup I can't say this, sup superrogatory actions. So going above and beyond it, I'm not morally obligated to, to donate to a, a homeless person. It's good if I do it, but under utilitarianism in general, it almost makes it a moral obligation. I have to donate. And not only that, how, how much do I have to donate? Should I give you know, so it's, these are kind of three general objections to utilitarianism, and then I'll give the rest of the time to you before we go to Matt, uh, Marvin, and Brian. Brian. 
Okay, so I uh, have to think of how uh, uh, how I would answer those uh, objections. So the the no rest problem doesn't seem to be a particular problem uh, for this versus like deontological or, or virtue ethicists or anything else. It's, a, it's the same kind of thing. It's all going to be based on practicality. I mean, every every system um, has to be pragmatic as well, and so prag. Um, so when it comes to uh, what to eat for breakfast, the no resting, um, that is a pragmatic uh, instance, which is a, a, which I have no reason to promote the desire. Let's say I want to have a Count Chocula for breakfast. Uh, that's what I desire. Do I have reasons to promote that desire? Uh, do we all have general reasons to promote that desire? Is that like a universalizable desire? Well, uh, no, there's, there's no reason that everybody uh, ought to eat Count Chocula. It's, it's just a sort of prudential ought for me. Whereas there are other things like, uh, you know, the desire, uh, to, the desire to not to rape uh, people or to uh, make sex consensual. Um, it, are ones that we all have reasons to uh, sort of universal, universalize. So um, I don't see any actual problem there. Um, the, the, uh, let's see, the, uh, super operatory actions, um, I'm trying to remember actually what, uh, that one, uh, was. It was the, I actually, I'm sorry, I've forgotten what you meant by that. Um, and as far as ob obligations, sorry? sorry. And it's almost like I'm obligated to donate to the homeless guy or something. It's, it's not, yeah, like it's, it's oh, not. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so like a desire, uh, like an, uh, an obligatory act would be, the act that a person with good desires would perform under those circumstances. So, uh, you know, a person has moral obligation to repay debts or tell the truth under conditions where a person with good desires would repay debts or tell the truth. Um, and pro prohibited stuff would be an act that a person with good desires would not perform under those circumstances. So taking the property of uh, another without consent is prohibited, where a person with good desires would not take that property. Uh, but you've also got... Uh, category of non-obligatory uh, permissions. So uh, an action that a person with good desires may or may not perform. Uh, there's a variety of, sh of shows that a person with good desires may decide to watch and a variety of foods one may decide to eat. With some exceptions, having good desires does not dictate, dictate a specific show to watch or specific food to eat. So that sort of goes back to what I was just saying about the decision to eat cereal or not versus a moral decision. Um, and I don't know if I actually answered your question, but the, the last question about all locations were uh, or not. You can sharpen that up if you want. And Fair enough. Yeah, no, yeah, thank you. I, I just wanted to sort of probe you a bit on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I know where this is Marvin and Brian's show, so I'm, I'm going to stop. Yeah. Well, that's that's uh, okay because I'm going to I'm going to jump in right now and um, ask you both to just take a minute to answer the question I ask. Uh, Randall, everyone gets to answer that. Uh, and so since I asked a Christian last, uh, Val, uh, desirism, uh, the person begging for money, uh, how do you get from point A to point B? Show your work. What do you do? Well, uh, the thing is, that's, I mean, even as uh, Randall pointed out to begin with, that's not a, um, a simple question necessarily for any theory because life especially a theory that's a moral realism theory because life is messy and if morality is based on real facts, you can expect a lot of messiness and you can't expect in every situation that you can just uh, give a simple A to B answer. Got it. And Understand so, that it's hard. What do you do? Uh, well, all I can say is that I, it seems to me that uh, the desire to uh, help others in need um, to the extent that uh, – uh, to the extent that we is practical, uh, and uh, it seems to be a uh, desire that uh, uh, would be a good desire to promote. It tends to be desire fulfilling. Um, if I have that desire uh, and I come upon this person uh, in the street who wants something, then I have the desire to uh, help that person, say, by giving money. Uh, that person has the desire to be helped, so his desire is being fulfilled. So it's a generally desire fulfilling uh, desire to uh, to do. As far as to how often and what actions will best help that person, that's going to be a more complicated empirical question, which I can't 
solve uh, because it, it will depend on that person's situation. But as a general principle, I think that the desire to uh, help others uh, to the extent possible is a desire, fulfilling desire. So okay. that makes sense to me. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, Val, don't go anywhere. Just put yourself on mute. It could be that, uh, you know, if you guys have time to stick around, Brian and um, uh, Marvin might want to have access to your minds. Uh, and since it's uh, it's really their show, uh, I want them to have access to whoever's uh, there. If they have some sharp questions for you, uh, I hope that you'll be available to answer them. Hey, uh, uh, Dale, um, before you answer that question, I want to see if I can't answer uh, a couple of yours for me. Uh, so one of the reasons for this harsh time limit is because I also had to make a, a little bit of space for this. I didn't want you to think that I uh, was ignoring your various missives. Uh, oh, what? The, the uh, yes, yeah. yes. So, cool. uh, so one of your questions uh, for me was, uh, you know, since I think that slavery is wrong in every possible universe and every possible circumstance, and so that's what I base uh, partly, you know, God being a moral monster, because, you know, whether I call it morality or evil, he did something that's wrong in every possible universe. So your first question is, do I still think that? And the answer is yes, I do. Uh, the second question is, well, isn't that an, uh, an instance of a uh, an ob objective morals? And I would just say, no, you, uh, you and many Christians continue to misunderstand uh, and misapply this. Um, universal agreement does not equal objective morality. Uh, and so, uh, in fact, if everyone in the world agreed that um, uh, slavery uh, is wrong in, in all possible situations, that is that in and of itself is not what makes it wrong uh, to me. And so, it, and it certainly doesn't make it objective. I'm glad that everyone agrees because there's one less negotiation I have to go through. Um, but as far as what makes it wrong, well, I, I apply my own standards of wrong, uh, of right and wrong, and those include things that I have talked about uh, over, over much, but I will just uh, repeat. I think that uh, in terms of human flourishing, there's no, there's no sense where slavery would um, uh, foster human uh, flourishing. As far as pro-social behavior goes, there's no sense in which uh, slavery is pro-social. Uh, there is a sense where slavery uh, deprives individuals of their rights and it, uh, ultimately deprives societies who inflict slavery on others, a, a type of dehumanization that's just as bad as the dehumanization that they're uh, applying to the slave. And so even under de desirism, it's not going to ultimately fulfill the desire uh, that they won't. And so no matter how you look at it, slavery is wrong. It doesn't need to be objectively wrong in the sense that you mean to be always wrong. And just because people universally agree uh, that it's wrong doesn't mean that it's objectively uh, wrong. And so I hope that that uh, addresses your question. Did you want to follow up on that? Yes, very quick. I, again, I'm, I'm so sorry to Brian and, and Marvin. This is your guys' show. So very quickly, no, it didn't answer my question at all because couldn't care less about – when I say universalizable, I mean it's exceptionless. And I, I'm interested in logical necessity. Couldn't care less about objectivity or whatever. Um, so I, I'm trying to get you to say that it's logically necessary. And you seem to have admitted it. There are no exceptions. It, it's true in every possible – the proposition slavery is wrong is true in every single possible world. You say yes. That, I, I disagree with that, but you say yes. So therefore, modal logic says the definition of logically necess necessity is it's true in every single logically possible world. It, it's exceptionless. And if you're giving that to me, then uh, amazing. I've, I've got you on that. And then it's just a, a – an easy trivial matter to say well a necessary being would be required to ground necessary truths you know? okay so i don't i don't think that that is the case uh i'm not going to argue with that over long because i do want to hand the mic uh over to marvin uh but uh, first of all when you talk about logically necessary necessary for what and so i i believe that there has to be some kind of uh goal uh, that you're going toward. And so it's not logically necessary for any number of things. So you have to say, well, logically necessary for what? I'm not sure what you mean by that. Just because it is true in every conceivable world that I can think of anyway. By the way, 
uh, true in every conceivable world that I can think of doesn't mean that it's true in every conceivable world. You might actually be able to think of a, a world where it's uh, mm -hmm. you know, where it would be different. I don't know. Maybe you could convince me of that, but I don't know what it is, and I've I've w tried to work that out in my mind. Uh, but that doesn't, to me, entail that it is logically necessary for anything. So if you say, well, um, it's it's logically necessary for human well-being. Well, I guess I guess that might be true as long as we're uh, going for a goal of human well-being. Uh, but you know, as a Christian, I would think that you would say, well, it's logically necessary to please God and for as many uh, souls to get to heaven as possible. Well, that's not a goal that I care about. Uh, and so necessary for what would be one of the questions that I would ask when you're talking about logically necessary. Um, I don't, I, so I, I don't actually accept the formulation that you're trying to impose on me there. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I, I see potential here. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But you, you have the mis same misunderstanding that Dan, the Bible nerd, had about necessary, meaning it's needed for something. That That's not what I'm talking about. So I, I see potentially progress behind the scenes if you want to discuss that with me privately. Well, I'm sure this is not the last time we have a, a chat about this on a mic. <laughs> Okay. Cool. You've, yeah. you've got a show. I'll have another season. We'll uh, we'll have a go at it. But uh, okay. thanks a lot. And I will ask you to uh, again, if you're going to stick around, just put your mic on uh, mute. Be uh, available for the stars of the show. We've got Andrew Knight waiting in the wings. We're not going to bring him in just yet. I'm going to let him wait a little bit longer. Um, so uh, hang in there, Andrew. I uh, I know you're still there. Uh, I'll make it worth your while. I promise. Of course, I never have up to this point, and I've been promising that for years. Um, so, uh, with, uh, without any further ado, uh, the stars, the stars of the show, uh, Marvin and Mr. Pointier. Hi there. Marvin, I don't think you've had a chance to talk yet. Why don't you start? Um, okay. So, I think that what, um... I will do is answer the question that um, David posed about um, <clears throat> giving money to the homeless person. <clears throat> For me, I think that it's, it's very straightforward because I subscribe to divine command theory in combination with virtue ethics. E virtue ethics can be gleaned from Matthew 5 in the Beatitudes in which Jesus tells us the kind of, uh, argues or gives us advice about the kind of people that we should be. So there, there's a sort of a biblical uh, basis there. But I don't, that's to give you my framework, but I actually don't need to appeal to that. I just appeal to virtue ethics and the idea of virtue ethics is that there is a kind of person that we should, uh, we ought to be. So the combination of what a virtue is a prudence, okay? Another virtue is kindness. So it's a good, it's a pretty straightforward issue to work out if I could afford to give to the uh, homeless person, how often I should give, how much I should give. Indeed, if I should give, given my situation and circumstance. And then kindness is also a virtue. So I can measure prudence against kindness to see if I should give to him, if I want to give to him. So although um, the decisions about what, what, how much and how often to give are in themselves quite difficult, the system of virtue ethics handles that situation quite um, quite comfortably, in my opinion. How about you, um, Brian? How do you handle that question? Wait, wait a minute. I, I oh, sorry. Before you go to Brian, <laughs> you've only half answered the question. I uh, I am now curious. Um, so, do you give? Yes or no? Well, sometimes. Yeah, I mean. What I've, what I've said is, it also depends on prudence. If I've got enough money, then yes, I give. If I haven't got enough money, 
then I, I'm not ob obligated to give. Well, let's say I ne you, you never carry cash, uh, which is the situation with me. You never carry cash, but you know that you're going to be passing by people who want money. So uh, if, if you think that, uh, you know, the virtuous thing is to give, shouldn't you just stop by a cash machine every day uh, or, you know, every week and have enough cash to give? I mean, that's not really an excuse. Um, I, I'm... I'm just I'm trying to see I, I I appreciate the answer that you've given so far, but I want you to take it another step and show me uh, how you figure out the rest of it. Let's say you've got enough money. It's not going to break you. You've got more money than a dollar. Um, you've got, you know, a dollar a day. Uh, let's say you decide that you're only going to give to one of the many homeless people who cost you, uh, you know, I, g give me a little bit more detail on uh, how to work that out. Well, I, I just don't. I just don't see any problem there, right? If if I ally kindness, right, with prudence, um, if I decide that I want to, I want to be kind and give, which I which I would do, depending on how much I have, prudence, that will determine if I should carry money, how how much I should give, when I should give, how often I should give. It's pretty straightforward. It's not not a a difficult um, equation. Okay, it's not a difficult difficult equation, but I don't know what the equation is. Um, so, uh, so you, I mean, am I am I a billionaire or uh, you're just an I, average? You know, you're just an average Joe. Your lunch, your lunchbox, Larry. So yeah, I I sh I personally, I would give because I want to be the I want to be a kind person, right? But how much should I give? Well, that depends on how much I can afford to give, which depends upon other commitments. That's it. Okay, fine. You make three hundred thousand dollars, three hundred thousand pounds. What do you What do you make in Hong Kong? Is it, uh, Hong Kong dollars? Three billion yen. Uh, you know what? Whatever, whatever Hong the. Kong dollars. Okay, I don't know what the I don't know what the calculation is there. You You make You make uh, a lot. You make plenty. Uh, so. Do you you know do you buy a homeless person a house at that point, or do you still give them a buck? I mean, I'm not, I'm not sure well, that I, having a. I, I, I mean, it, yeah. I'm not sure out. having enough money and having a lot of money makes a real difference in how much you give a, a, a beggar when he asks you for a dollar. I don't, I don't. But look, I don't want to. I don't well, want to belabor the issue. Yeah, I just, that, I'm just that, trying that, to get past the idea that this is an easy equation that you can figure out because I haven't figured it out in years. And I've been trying. What I've said, yeah, what I've said is, is that virtue ethics handles it easily. Okay? okay, it's the virtue ethics that handles it easily. Okay, now if you're asking me for personal particulars like that, and you've just said that I'm a, I'm a rich person, well, then prudence still has a part to play, because it depends on the expendable income that I've left with, and it also depends on other. Uh, things that are going on in my life at the time. Let me give you an example. Okay. I knew I knew um, an atheist fellow here in Hong Kong, and um, what he did was um, took uh, a couple. He managed to take a couple of orphans from Thailand. And give them a very good life and an education in Hong Kong, right? So he was still, he was, he was still being, um, he he was still being kind, but I mean, that that act of kindness of giving the person in Hong Kong a, a dollar a day on the street is also balanced against the other other acts of kindness that are going on in his life. So, again, virtue ethics is talking about the kind of person that one wants to be and you you balance that across that person's life okay look i, I, mean, I, I hope that's I hope that's kind of capturing the essence of what i'm, sure. I'm trying to say it, it's, it's about the kind of person that you want to be it, it's it's, you, fair, yeah. it's fair enough um I, and i'm going to give you the chance marvin uh, before this is over to hit me with a uh, similar question. Uh, it wouldn't be fair for me to ask the question that I came up with to answer the question that I came up with. That's that's pretty easy. That's that's cheating. So I will let you uh, hit me with any type of um, 
moral conundrum that you won't, and I will do my best to show my work. Brian, before I uh, let you uh, at Marvin, uh, I need you to show your work. Sure. Yes, I give them money. That's not good enough. I need you to show more well, work. See, so I can't make you happy no matter what. The people no. that gave you long-winded preambles got your goat, and now I give you the straight dope, and that's not good either. No. Well, okay, so tell me, do you give them money every time? No. All right, so how often do you give I'm, money? I'm, ha- I'm, happy to, I'm happy to expound, David. I'm just trying to I'm sure. play no, a little game here. Go ahead. But, uh, yeah, no, I – a great question to ask because it, it brings into relief my biggest impression of listening to all the shows in this series and it's that these upper level high level philosophical umbrellas for morality are so much less important than boots on the ground doing good things and not doing bad things yep. so in the example you gave if i'm walking down the street and i'm flush with cash i'm on vacation nowhere to go no, no sweat i give the guy whatever i can let go of if I got my baby in my hands and I'm running to the hospital because they're choking, I don't even think twice about not giving them money. So, of course, what matters is the context in which the uh, the thing happens. What are the all the goods that can happen? What are all the bads that can happen? And you have to weigh them in whatever amount of time you have while you're in, in front of this person. And you make the best call that you can. Yeah. So I'm just going to uh, disappoint uh, the crowd right now and say i'm almost never going to give him money in the situation that you gave i'm flush with cash i'm on vacation someone asked me for a dollar i'm not reaching in my pocket to grab a, a dollar or to to let them know where my bills are uh that's that's a great way to get your money stolen and your camera and to uh, end up with a knot on your head no freaking way <laughs> so see this see that this is why you need to show on morality david you're gonna learn something <laughs> maybe, maybe. I'm, I'm gonna learn that you are going to get yourself killed on vacation. Uh, yeah. So. But, but again, so I, I agree with you 100%. I don't pull out my wallet and let all of my you know cash flow. Here, here would you hold sky, my camera right? here while I get my wallet? <laughs> <laughs> I do a brisk walk and I give him like a Heisman. I just chuck the dollar as I'm still moving. He can't even see my face. I've got, I know I've got some one here amidst all these 20s. Just hang on. Let me. <laughs> <laughs> let, let, let me let me put away my platinum card that anybody can use by just sticking it in a slot. Yeah. Be, hey, hold this for a second. Hold it for a second while I get out my big bill. So yeah, I mean um, that it, re- that reminds me of a Christian friend of mine who was held up in Los Angeles. Uh, they asked the 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 um, the guy said to him, "Hey, you got a dollar?" And his uh, response was, "Sorry, I've only got a 20. Yeah, that's the that's the invitation right there, right? Yeah, this, you're right. And look, I've had my um, uh, I've had a person try to steal my um, wallet once. It was uh, it was almost a mugging. In fact, I don't think it was a wallet at all. I think it was just some bills uh, that I had. And they asked for something, and I. Uh, I was going to give him something, and he reached and uh, grabbed and tried to grab the whole thing or whatever it was. I, I don't remember exactly. Um, but I managed to hold on to it, and I chased him for a while um, because, <laughs> because I was pissed off. Um, so, and this was, when you had good, this was when you had good knees, right? Yeah, this is when so I had knees, gave, right. You right. gave good chase, right? I gave, I gave good chase. Uh, I was uh, look, I'll be honest with you. I, I was going to beat the snot out of him. Uh, I wasn't going to have someone. Honestly, I wasn't going to have someone walking around on the street uh, who has me marked as someone who could be mugged, and now he's been thwarted, and he's going to come back uh, and sneak up on me the next time. No, I was going to beat him senseless. Um, I didn't catch him. It was probably a good thing I didn't. But um, you, you, you were messing with the wrong guy at that time. I'll, I'll put it that way. I may I may have seemed like an easy mark. Uh, and I know that Andrew is uh, a- anxious <laughs> to come off of mute uh, and talk about uh, some of those days. I'm sure he's had other encounters. But uh, when you have a, a disability like uh, legal blindness and it's something that um, is visible that people can see, you're going to be taken advantage of. You need to be well trained and you better be uh, ready to fight uh because flight is not always an option for you. Uh, and if you can't fight, you're a target. Uh, I could fight. And I would have, I would have beat, the, beat the person after death. 
Uh, and um, so that day uh, I did not catch him, uh, and he got none of my money, and uh, I have been much smarter uh, about things like that since then. And so, you know, do I? does that mean that I'm a bad per- person? My moral calculus works differently where – uh, I would not. I mean, I I encounter three people a day uh, on the trains or the subways who you know have professional uh, begging speeches and you know systems and so forth. I recognize it. I I, I continue reading my newspaper. Um, but that said, uh, I do appreciate the input there. I will be um, uh, asking. Uh, others, anyone else who appears on the show, the same question. And with that said, uh, Marvin and uh, Brian, uh, please take it away. Go ahead, Brian, because I'm not actually that sure what, um, we're, you know, what what the format is. So um, The format uh, is, uh, we've had six shows so far. You've heard uh, a lot of them yeah. uh, discuss um, challenge, and uh, if you want to uh, either bring uh, myself or uh, Val or Dale or Andrew on okay. to, uh, okay. to uh, question, uh, then you can do that. So it's, in a sense, it's a summary and uh, clarification questions, that kind of thing. Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. So let me, so I'm, I'm happy to go first because I kind of, I kind of preambled where I wanted to go next with what I was just saying. So uh, in particular, when I was listening to the Dale and Val show on moral ontology, which I found fascinating, I, Loved listening to the entirety of it. I was glad to get more today uh, with Val early in the show. But but again, I, I couldn't help but come away from that show thinking this this part isn't the important part. You could almost skip this. You don't need a you know laminated membership card of the umbrella philosophy of your morality in order to be on the ground doing good things for good people, not doing bad things to other people trying your best, trying to be a good member of society and not being a jerk. Uh, I just I just found that it was it, it, you could talk about those things for hours. And, and I don't think you get anywhere without actually getting to the boots on the ground level that I think is more important. And I think David is alluding to while bringing up brass tax examples and, and requiring actual answers. So I'm curious if you think that uh, that's off base or you agree somewhat or what your what your reaction to that is. Oh, good. Um, I, I mean, at the end of the day, I think that uh, the discussion the discussion is about aspects of moral- morality, and I think that you you just have to discuss aspects of morality. Sometimes um, they can sound uh, very abstract uh, because if one has not spent time, sort of contemplating uh, morality it, it's quite an abstract yet I would say intuitive uh, it, it's intuitive that we have it but abstract when we we kind of analyze it and I think that the reason that we do try to analyze it is so that we can understand it better we can understand what is good what is not what we should put into action I mean the, the whole kind of project is to know what kind of people we should be and in order to know what kind of people we should be we need to do an analysis and try to put those principles that we gain from that analysis into practice okay yeah i mean i i I don't have any problem with that i think that makes a lot of sense and i think what you said there dovetails with what i was saying which is the reason you would go to that abstract level is to make you a better moral practicer to make you a better individual in the world being moral Mm -hmm. so to the end so if if all of this abstract discussion doesn't get me there if i am you know if i can if i can espouse the perfect moral philosophy but i'm a drunk and a cheat and a and a jerk and 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 a fighter then you know i'd rather have someone who's the opposite which doesn't know a single word that val and dale talked about in their call but was good to people was kind you know fought evil uh, was a good neighbor. You know, I would take that person any day of the week over the person that had all the high-minded philosophy but didn't put any of it into practice. Mm-hmm. Good. Yeah. All uh, right. I, Show's I, over, David. We got it covered. Yeah, I think I think that's uh, I think that's good. Uh, you know, uh, 
intuitively, we like morally, you know, good people. I, I can't, um, I, I can't, uh, you know, find any reason to object with that. I mean, that's that's exactly why why Dale and I are trying to outline a system of ethics is so that people can can attain that system of, of ethics. They can learn from it, and that they can so that they can be the kind of people that we want them to be, and that we want ourselves to be. That's the whole idea. I mean, right. you know, you you could be a I, I don't know who's let, let's let's take it that Adolf Hitler was was a genius. I don't know if he was or or not, right? I mean, he was really good. He was really good at canasta. That's all oh, okay. I know about him. He could he could be a genius, but um, the way he acted is is paradigmatic of how not to act. So yeah, and and having said that, you know, um, you could get. Um, Somebody who's com- completely kind on the on the street, who acts very, who, who knows very little, and uh, I couldn't fault in terms of how they live their lives with, <clears throat> in terms of relationships, in terms of truth, how they speak to people, how they interact with people. So, yeah. So let me let, let me just let me I jump think, in. I, I just throw this at you. I think Socrates' ba- Socrates' main project was to outline moral theory. And his kind of idea was the unexamined life is not worth living. And that through examining one's life, one was able to understand what the good is and aim towards that good. So his whole high-minded project was to become a better person. I think he's right. Yeah, so let me let me jump in uh, here real quick. Uh, first of all, I don't. Uh, so I, I don't think that you can make a judgment about the quote-unquote the unexamined life the average person is not sitting around thinking about moral philosophy and uh, you know where their life fits into all of that and where it fits in their lives uh, they're just living their lives very much like apes live their lives they're not examining their lives either they uh, you know they they want a banana for breakfast they get a banana they do their social things with their groups uh, they um, so a they, quick question for you do you think do you think talking about moral philosophy makes you a better person does it change you in any way or does it have no effect no it has zero effect on me i i find it um, okay then then we differ yeah i find i find it meaningless uh, (laughs) to to be honest uh uh, yes i know i've been doing a, a long series on um morality but i i find the philosophical part of it um simply uh antithetical to the way humans actually live and think uh this is this is this is not how we human, uh, if you will. And I think that there is a, a class of person, maybe the moral philosopher, who is so high-minded that they have simply forgotten uh, what life is for the average person uh, who has to uh, scrape by with a nine-to-five that they hate uh, and uh, support a, uh, a wife or a husband that they have you know, fell out of love with a long time ago, and they're raising their two point seven kids, um, and uh, you know that's a chore, and there's never enough money. And th- this person is not spending their day uh, thinking, not even one moment of their day thinking about moral philosophies, and yet they can live a perfectly happy, perfectly fulfilled life. And th- uh, the moral philosopher would say, "Oh no, they can't. Their life isn't worth living." Uh, because they haven't no, they examined their they life. Would, they wouldn't. They wouldn't say that. I, I quoted Socrates. I mean, perhaps Socrates would say it, but the average moral philosopher wouldn't say that. In fact, according to that uh, Netflix show that we got from the from the US, <laughs> the good life, the moral philosopher ends up in hell. Did you see that one? <laughs> the point. <laughs> the you, point. You, you is, just you just ruined the the show. I uh, I I haven't I haven't I haven't seen it all yet. <laughs> Where's the spoiler alert? Come the on, point is, yeah, I, I, I'm politically incorrect in that sense. Yeah. Put it. Let, let, so let me let me gear it down, knock it down a, a notch. Moral philosophy is reasoning about right and wrong and how those concepts uh, interact. Okay, so. Yeah, you get people who get to to very high abstract, abstract levels, but um, 
similarly, somebody who's uh, on the street or works in a factory and, and sort of decides what they do to ba based on their reason, their reason is in a sense doing the same reasoning as the highfalutin mo uh, uh, moral philosopher. They're just unable to systematize it or perhaps uh, categorize areas of their moral philosophy as well. Uh, or as articulately, or as, uh, what's the word, uh, using the same conventions that uh, a moral philosopher does. So I still think that um, when you talk about application, you, you still need to have uh, uh, moral knowledge and then apply that moral knowledge, even if you're giving to the person on the street. You don't have to, you don't have to reason that, um, well, I'm a virtue eth ethicist, so therefore it... it I, giving to this person on the street is something that I could do. You could just give from your gut and reason that, um, you know, it's a good thing to do and I can afford it. Which is I, which is what I think most people do. They don't have a moral philosophy uh, uh, guiding I, their I, path as some kind yeah. of lamppost um, uh -huh. as, as far as what to do. But what I, what I want to do is move this conversation to a place where I thought it was uh, dodged a bit, uh, to be frank, uh, through – much of this conversation. I thought that Val and um, Dale's conversation would cover a little bit more of this. I know they're still listening to me. Uh, they can hear me. Um, but I thought I thought it missed an opportunity. And the opportunity that I want you to pick up on, Marvin uh, and Brian, uh, is the moral ontology question of where does God fit into this? What is, um, what, what's the real deal here? I, I continue to express uh, almost every day on the board that the Christian and the atheist are not talking about the same thing uh, when they're talking about God. And the Christian, uh, when you get them to define God in some way, or uh, they, uh, sorry, when you get them to define good in some way, it always includes God. The good includes the God. It's the moral nature of God. Uh, as Dell might say, it is new, uh, God's nature is numerically equal to the good. Uh, when you uh, quiz an atheist own good, uh, their their version of good has nothing to do with God. They are, in fact, talking about different things, and you can catch them at it all the time. And so I want you, Marvin, to uh, connect the dots for me. Where does God come into the good? If it if he does not, then let's let's just quit talking about God when we talk about morality. And if he mm -hmm. does, be very clear uh, about your statement of uh, where God fits into your definition of the good. Uh, Marvin, you, then uh, Brian, I'm going to ask uh, Andrew for the first time to come in uh, on this and follow up on your answers while I uh, while I take a break. Thanks, David. I think that um, as a Christian, then I do think the most plausible uh, definition of what good is, is that it is rooted in God's essential nature. Now, since what we do know, or what, what Christians believe, is that God is a trinity of persons in perfect unity, perfect love, perfect relationship. Therefore, whatever you, what, that is an exemplar of what good is. And I don't think there's a, any, I don't think there's a better e exemplar. And I think that if you try to go the route that the atheist will go or the materialist, materialist will go and not give an exemplar but try to define what good is, then you're just going to fall into uh, G.E. Moore's open question, which is to say, if you, can, if, you, if you find a property and say, what is good of that property, you can always ask, well, why is that, why is that good? That's that's the that's the way I would cash it out. Right, and then from my perspective, uh, as an atheist, uh, I don't believe that there's a god. Uh, but again, I'm doing my morality from the ground up. I'm starting with the base of what you know are undeniable facts that we would agree on: that I exist, you exist, a bunch of people exist, and we're here living together. And we need to figure out how to do that 
successfully. And there are many ways to define successfully, but we can have those discussions and debates and get there together. So to me, doing the, well, you got to have a source for the good, and the source of the good is this God, and it's in his nature, well, that's just great, but it can't stop there, right? Because now you still need the, okay, so what should I do? And if the good coming out of God's nature is telling me to love my neighbor and to be kind and generous and helpful, well, I can get on board with those things without this God source. I can get on to those things because they promote good outcomes, things that I want, things that other people want, things that we can mutually agree are good for us. I don't need to know anything about the nature of God to get on board with those things. And then conversely, if the because the good is rooted in God's nature, it's telling me I'm supposed to throw rocks at homosexuals. Well, I'm sorry that even if it is in the source of God's nature that that is flowing out good, I'm not picking up any rocks. I'm not throwing any rocks at homosexuals because at that point, my path has just deviated from this source of good. I don't want to be on that source of good path. I want to be on a different path. And it involves not throwing rocks at people because of the type of people they love. So to me, I just don't see why it matters that the God, the, the source of the good is flowing out of God's nature. If it's going to take us to a place where you have to do mental gymnastics to get to why homosexuality is wrong. Well, that's, that's coming from yeah. a place of coming, coming from, a, a, from an old book and from a God's mind. That doesn't, that just doesn't retract me. Well, that's really, I, I, I get you. But the question is, well, what is good? You know, I've I've given an example of what good is, right? Right. And I've given I've given I've given an example and pointed to that relationship and said, look, this is a perfect example of what good is. What do you think good is, right? And if you and to be honest, if you read the if you read the Bible, the Bible is now telling us that the Old Testament laws are abrogated. So. I would say that we're morally obliged. Because we're morally obliged. It's an objective moral fact that we should no should should not throw rocks at homosexuals, <clears throat> regardless of, of as if regardless as as to whether somebody says we should. It's an objective moral fact given the New Testament that we should not uh, torture homosexuals based on their lifestyle. Would you Would you agree with that? That that's an objective fact. I don't agree that it's an objective fact. Sorry, I, an, object, I, well, an objective moral principle, sorry. Again, I don't want to get into the objective subjective because the other thing I learned from these conversations is there's about 50 different ways you can parse that, and I think it gets you into a bad spot. But let me answer directly what well, you said there. I, yeah, I can give it's, a definition. Yeah. It's, it's not necessary for where I'm going with this. So if the New Testament says we shouldn't throw rocks at homosexualities, hooray for the, no, the New Testament. If the Old Testament said you should, and the reason you should is because God said so, then those people who did it on God's say so were not acting morally. They were being obedient. And I do not put obedience as equal to moral. Yeah, but um, the thing is that morals will always clash. And when they clash, then you choose the lesser of two evils. Yeah? Uh, so it doesn't. Yeah, and the lesser. In back in Old Testament times, the lesser of two evils was don't pick up the damn rock, don't throw it at somebody. I think that's pretty pretty straightforward. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, 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 you know, I, from my located perspective, all I could say is uh, you shouldn't um, you shouldn't kill homosexuals based on on who they are. Um, in the Old Testament, there there was reasons for that. I suppose I've not, you know, there are reasons for that. Where, and this is, and that's the move that I don't understand. I, I wouldn't even dream about trying to say, well, maybe there were some good reasons to throw the rocks at the homosexuals. I, so I, is, I, it, I would, so I is would, it? So is it an objective fact then that they were wrong to throw rocks at the uh, homosexuals? Not an objective fact, but it well, was not. It? Acting, well, it was not acting morally to throw a rock at somebody because they're gay. It wasn't Why was moral it? then. Why it was might it have been not an objective fact that the God was there and saying, "Hey, do this or else." So that why might be an objective fact, but I don't believe it is. So but why I can would understand it? why somebody who is, you know, cowering in front of a God might say, "Hey, I should pick up the rock and throw it at someone," but I don't think they're being moral by doing it. Okay, what? Why are they not being moral? Because they're injuring someone with a rock because why of who they not, love. Why is, 
why is it wrong to injure somebody with a rock? See, this, this is the part that, that just makes it's me just crazy. A, it's, do, it's a simple do we really, question. Do we really have it's, to get there? Well, it's do a we, simple question. Do we really question. have to answer that question? It's a simple question. Why are they wrong to kill somebody, injure somebody with a rock? Simple question. Right? Why is it wrong? Because you just threw a rock at someone and injured them or killed them because of who they love. Flip it around. Why, why is, is it that good wrong? To throw a rock why? at someone's face and hurt them or kill them. What, Tell me why, why it's it, good. Why is it? Why is it wrong? Causing unnecessary harm for no reason. Why is it wrong to to, to cause unnecessary harm? Because morality is about how we comport ourselves in the world, to interact with each other, and have successful outcomes. And if you and I can't agree that not having rocks in our faces because of who we love is not a successful outcome, then again, this conversation terminates here and we can go in another branch. Because well, I honestly you, don't understand you can why do, this is a problem. You, you, you can do what you want, but my point is that it's objectively wrong, right? And I think that it's wrong It's wrong to, to injure people. The um, point is that I'm pointing towards a moral intuition. The moral, intu the moral intuition is that we should not harm people, right? You're telling me there's no objective moral intuitions, and I'm saying, well, that seems to be a moral intuition that you're uh, pointing to. Yet you don't no, want no, to. I, I, you don't want I to admit say, that it's a that you don't want it. You don't want to admit that it's an, a moral intuition. I, I, did, I didn't say it was not a moral intuition. Yeah. I didn't say there. No, no, I didn't. I said it wasn't an objective fact. There's a difference. I okay, agree okay. that I, okay. I agree and that I have an intuition to not hurt notice, people, notice but I believe I that's born out of the physical facts of the universe and evolution and biology. Okay, so you think it could be born out of the physical facts of the universe and um, and uh, and the universe? Okay, so let let me run let me run this by you. Okay, morality is is kind of a, I I would say it's a it's a very different thing to what we would expect to come from evolution, right? Because evolution tracks with adaptivity right moral intuitions okay. moral intuitions don't uh, track with uh, adaptivity so let, let me give you an ex let me give let me throw a thought experiment out there and see how you would handle that so take for take for instance okay hominids are evolving they're in a cave and um, instead of coming out of the cave and developing the society that we have developed, we could have gone into the cave and developed a morality that is, say, similar to termite. So, if we had developed a morality that was similar to termites, we would kill fertile... Uh, we would kill fer fertile uh, females cannibalize them to protect the queen, right? So we could have evolved a kind of morality that tracks tracks adaptivity and if it did try to track adaptivity, we would end up with a, a moral code that was adaptive. Now, to me that, that is intuitively wrong, that we could have evolved a morality like that. Would you right. agree with that? Well, the, the reason it doesn't track for you intuitively is because we have human brains and not termite brains. If we had termite brains, that might track wonderfully intuitively. I honestly can't say, but I can envision that if I had a termite brain, I, I would envision things differently. Okay. I'm sorry, so, I, don't know, I don't know what that, that noise was, but I think it's gone. So, but yeah, so, and, and, it, and if I had a termite brain, and rather than talking to you on the on the on the call right now, Marvin, I'd probably be chewing on this chair right here because, God damn, does it look delicious? Yeah, but I'm not talking about we would have termite brains. I'm saying that we would track the, the, that adaptivity could have given us the same kind of morality that termites have, right? I mean, uh, it, 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 theoretically, it, it theoretically could it theor theoretically could have, but it did not. And if it had. The facts on the ground about our, our biology and the world around us would be different, and so we'd have to have that conversation with all of those facts on the ground. But my but my point is that it could have given us such a morality, right? 
And if it did give us such a, but it's inconceivable. So since it's inconceivable that it did give us such a morality, how can we, it's just inconceivable that morality could, uh, sorry, uh, evolution could give us morality. Right. But again, I, you're, you're missing the point here, which is it's in, you cannot get out of your operator status. You're a human. So the fact that it's inconceivable, inconceivable to you as a human, the way we are now is because of the evolutionary history that brought us here. If we had a different evolutionary history, we would have different intuitions. And the inconceivability would change. Again, the loveliness of this chair as my dinner would be different if I had a termite brain. It is inconceivable to me that I will start chewing on this chair. But if I were a termite, I would have those uh, those desires. Mm-hmm. I, I want to just I guess, jump. I want to jump in. I guess real... what I'm getting at. Guess what I'm getting at is that uh, if you hold to evolutionary uh, mechanisms brought about uh, evolution, it lacks sensitivity, right? That's what uh, theorists call sensitivity. It's just insensitive to um, uh, moral intuitions. So I, I, I want to I want to jump in and just get uh, some clarification before the point gets too far uh, in the rears uh, and we never get it back. Uh, Marvin, you were uh, saying uh, a little bit ago uh, that uh, it's intuition that tells you uh, what is objectively right and wrong. Is that a fair mm-hmm. summary? I think that I think. Uh... Partly intuition, okay. partly but, part, part, partly uh, we learn, okay. partly condition, partly conditioning, but mostly intuition. I would say, yeah. Oh, okay, so and you were saying that, um, and, and Brian was ob- objecting that it, it's wrong to throw rocks uh, at people for being homosexual, and mm-hmm. and your your response is, well, yeah, I know that it's wrong because my intuition tells me it's wrong. Um, so I'm, I'm challenged by that answer, uh, with you as a Christian, because the people, whether, whether it's your God or the people who wrote the Bible speaking for your God clearly had a different intuition, uh, and their intuition was that it is oh so very right, uh, to pick up stones and, uh, murder a person, uh, for being, uh, uh, for, for engaging in same sex activity. Uh, so how do you explain the difference between your intuition and the intuition of the people who wrote the Bible uh, saying? OK, that? so do you, when the pe- if the people picked up rocks to stone homosexuals, do you think do you think they thought it was a good thing? Yes, because they were told it was a good thing. They were told it was thus saith the Lord. They, didn't, they weren't told it was a good thing. They were told it was something that they needed to do. But, well, but their understanding was that God is the one who told them that that's what they needed to do. And since God yeah, is mean, all good and all loving. Yeah, it doesn't mean it's a good thing. It means it's a good thing relative to other outcomes. Well, obeying God is a good thing, so and let, God let is all you, good, let me, right? Let me, give, let me give you an example. It was not a good thing that a man was uh, nailed to a cross, tortured, and then died, Right. That's not actually a good thing to do that to somebody, but it is good relative to the outcomes. Well, it's it's it's, it's, given, it's a thing that given, it's a thing that Christians Christian, celebrate every given the, give, yeah. Given the Christian right, story, Christians celebrate it, they the don't very, mourn it. They don't mourn it the, every week. They the celebrate very, it every week, right? And the very point that I'm trying to make is is that morals clash. Okay, right? but I'm, then, I'm just I'm just do, trying do, to doing, understand how the intuition is different when you say. It is your intuition that it is wrong, objectively wrong, to stone a person for being homosexual. And yet the writers of the Bible, I'm not going to say God said, because I I know where the trap is there, but the ones who wrote the Bible had the intuition that that's what God wanted people to do. And so I'm... But you're you're getting things confused because it doesn't mean that the the people who wrote the Bible had the intuition that that's what God wanted wanted people to do morally. That's what God prescribed as a punishment for those people at that time. And that, and that was a just, that, that was a, they thought that was a just when, when punishment, you're, right? When, you, when you're adding in, you know, that's, they thought it was all right or they didn't, you know, have any 
guilt about that. That's just your own import. Well, no, I'm not, it, well, but it was a just punishment by God. If it, it was, if they thought I, it wasn't I, I assume, a just punishment, I assume, I assume they thought it was a just punishment. Okay, and they yeah, and they think that that justice is good and God's justice is good. Yes. Well, I think that they would have thought, given what that would have meant to that society. Okay, I'm gonna that, I'm gonna bring that, Andrew that was, I'm gonna bring Andrew in at this yeah. moment if he's uh, if he's still there because I I want to give him a. But uh, how about you, David? How would you how would you answer that question about? Um, I'll I'll let Andrew answer that, I'll let Andrew answer sense. that one right now. Yeah. yeah. All right. First. Thanks, it, Andrew. It, how would hey, you answer that question about? Uh, well, let me back up for a second. I, I want you to ask me the question again, so don't dodge it. But I want to take a second for uh, for the audience and demystify part of this conversation. So uh, early on, when you and Brian uh, started talking, you said, "Well, look, I've given an example, uh, an exemplar of of what I point to with my ethical system," and, and uh, you've you've sort of hung your hat there. I understand it. I, I don't oh, have sure. a problem. Yeah. yeah. So, so let me say that I, uh, I wholeheartedly agree that when we are exploring ethics, one of the best things that we can do is ask ourselves what examples of our ethics are, right? But, but an exemplar uh, for the audience is just a, a typical example or an excellent model of a thing. And so when we talk about ethics on the, uh, on the atheist side, and obviously atheism, atheism is not an ethic, right? So, so we might have, uh, uh, you know, you might ask, uh, you might ask 10 atheists and get 11 different ethics, right? Okay. Um, but that's the, the same thing is true of Christians. We don't, uh, we don't find necessarily, even in that Christian show that we had the other day, that Christians necessarily agree on, uh, the rights and wrongs in their moral system. So uh, I think when you say uh, you can give an exemplar and you use something like the Trinity as an example, uh, that's perfectly fine. But it doesn't indicate at all that, uh, that a humanist can't point to a good example of their own ethics. Now, whether Brian chose to do that or not doesn't mean that he can't. Nor, uh, nor does it mean that because you invoke the talisman of the Trinity, uh -huh. you're necessarily right about your conception of that relationship and how it's conducted. It's, it's very possible, as a, for instance, that you would have some misunderstanding that would apply to your ethical system. You don't understand the Trinity in the way you think you do, and you come out with a wrong ethic. So, uh, not saying thanks for, we, thanks, yeah, thanks for that, Andrew. I think that's a good idea. A, uh, some good thoughts. My point is, number one, is that an, exam an exemplar is good because if I give an exemplar, right, uh, that avoids trying to define goodness in, uh, in words, which is always going to be open to G. E. Moore's open question. When I asked Brian, right, why it was good, then we can always ask the question why that is good. In some way, you're going to have to give a definition. If that definition might be, might, might be non-moral, Right, and then you're going to end up saying something non-moral is what is good. Then we're going to ask the question, why is that is good? Now you're right. You can uh, the, the humanist can give uh, an exemplar, but the humanist is in is in exactly the same uh, boat as the, as the theist, but deeper. Yeah, the exemplar you you could give may not be a perfect example of a person, right, who lived a virtuous life like Jesus. At least Jesus. Uh, did Le Je Jesus is one example in that he le that he led what I, led what I what we understand to be a perfect life as the Trinity is a, so, an example of a perfect relationship. I mean, what's your exemplar? Okay, which, exa so, which exemplar oh, oh, are you going to point to? Because everything is probable, right? Everything yeah. is possible. The, the 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 point is what is probable. So okay, given that, let me, let me what, respond. What, yeah. let, let me respond to that bit because we'll rapidly get to a point where we're piling points on points and something will get lost. So, so let me respond to the first bit of this about uh, Jesus and the Trinity. You can make a claim that Jesus led a perfect life. I will simply say that I don't agree. And, okay. and, and I'm perfectly willing to go verse by verse through uh, text like, um, like the claim Sermon on the Mount. 
And we can talk about verse by verse why you might think some of that advice is perfect and how Jesus led a, a life uh, in conduct that perfectly exemplified those verses. Yeah. Be happy to talk about that and talk about why I think it's nonsense. So you can make a claim of moral perfection. So you're, you're not answering the question. Well, I, well, I, hold on. I okay. am. Okay. I absolutely am answering the question, and, and you need to hear what I'm saying. Okay. I don't, I don't care that you think you have a perfect example. The question is not whether you think you have a perfect example, but whether you can demonstrate that you have a perfect example in such a way that everyone else uh, should, should line up behind whatever it is that you think. Right now, we don't have that agreement. Yeah, it's getting it's getting a bit complex. This question, you, you, yeah, keep going. Well, you're keep the one that invited the question, but not me. Sure, sure. Complex means a question that presupposes a question, but keep continue. Yeah. Well, no, look. I'm, so I, I, I'm willing to be done with that part of it, and we can move back. Forward. So yeah. But so what? What? What, 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 what is it that? What is it you've just said? You've just said that the Christian can't um, produce. An exemplar is that is that your point? No, no, not at all. What, so, well, what's your point? That you, that my, you can my point was this. I will say it again. I'll say it clearly. Can, that you can. I'll, okay. I'll be happy to say it clearly. You think you have a perfect a perfect exemplar? You've given two, Jesus and the Trinity. Yeah. As far as I can tell, we don't have uh, we don't have any kind of knowledge to lead us to believe that there is such a thing as a perfect exemplar in the Trinity. Uh, and we disagree as skeptics with Christians over whether Jesus. OK, was so, we, so we've got there, right? You, you don't think that they're perfect exemplars, right? So my point is, well, what's your exemplar or what's your moral, moral theory? Because, you know, you, you can say that your system isn't perfect. OK, or at least I'm not uh, articulating it in a way that it is, it is perfect. So what's your moral theory? Where's your exemplar? Sure. So and if you don't want an exemplar, you tell me what your moral theory is. I, I don't mind giving exemplars. I think, it's a, I think it's a silly word when we can just say, here's an example. Um, my moral theory has to do with human thriving. In fact, I wrote a long post about this uh, okay. a, a few days ago. I'm yeah. positive you read it because you had follow-up to it. In fact, not only did you have follow-up to it, uh, it, was, it was the Harvard Project on Human Thriving, and you agreed by and large with a lot of the conditions laid out in that project. I am saying as a human and as a humanist, by and large, um, I might have – might have some minor qualms with that label, but I am saying by and large that I think those are uh, those are good high water marks uh, to you to, know and yeah I, I did let, let me mm -hmm. just finish that yeah. sentence to yeah. determine whether humans are uh, at at any individual level reaching their potential and whether we are doing the things we need to do to set up an environment to allow people to thrive. So it's pretty simple. And I'll be happy to give examples of those if we need to. Okay. So you posted that uh, the Harvard project on, on, what was it called? Human Thriving. So, so I don't have the post in front of me. It was called it's, Human Thriving. Or, I think it was called Human Wellness. I, I don't right? remember. And, and, and here's my point. I wholeheartedly agreed that that was a good project, right? And that that project, as far as I could see, is best the outcome of virtue ethics. That's right? not what they say. That's, that's my point, and that's why I agreed with it. And okay. I'm saying, if you if you've got a, a utilitarian system, right? I don't see how you're going to get to the such a such a a, a, a diverse um, range of um, qualities or attributes. That were detailed in the Harvard project. Well, but you didn't read very deeply, then, did you? Well, okay, well then, were, then, were, then tell me how you're going to do it. Well, so tell us how you're going to do it. Clear about exactly what that project was about. It was about taking it the what it's about. Well, it's do, about you how, me, do you want how, me to respond to it, or do you how are you going to how are you going to get there? Okay, let's respond, please. I'll keep quiet. 
That's what I was saying. So uh, this is exactly what I was talking. How do they get changing the question? That's right. right. Yeah, carry on. Right. Sure. So you want to know not how I get there, because that's not what's on the table between us. What you actually want to know is how they got there, because that's the thing we're talking about. And they were actually quite, they were actually quite explicit, weren't they? They said, here's what we get out of medical research. Here's what we get out of sociological research. Here's what we get out of psychological research. And it is the goal of that project to take those objective metrics that we know lead to human thriving. Things like good health care, things like good education, things like self-determination, uh, things like uh, you know countries where you're not being disadvantaged for some of the reasons that you may have been disadvantaged in your life or that I have been disadvantaged in my life. And it is those things that we can quantitatively measure and determine whether a society is reaching its potential and whether individuals within that society have the ability to reach their potential. That's what we call human thriving. And it was the goal of that project to take those objective metrics and help work those into social sciences that are less objective. Yeah. Um, I was so I'm still not quite tracking with you because as far as I understand, those are perfectly consistent with virtue ethics, right? They're not consistent with utilitarian, which was utilitarianism, which was being expounded, right? And the reason they're not, the reason they're, the reason they're not, the reason they're not, you know, uh, they're not conducive with utilitarian, utilitarianism is that utilitarianism is a, a set of specified rules to bring about, uh, specified outcomes, okay? John, John Rawls, uh, a, uh, an ethicist, systematized it. He did it like this. He said, look, you need a, a theory of right action. Okay. And you need a notion of what is right or the good. Right? That's what, that's what you're aiming at. And sure. you also, you also need to kind of have an appraisal of what the outcomes are he, he called that moral worth right so i'm sa so i'm saying this the moral worth we agree on because the harvard project was a, a good example of that right um i say that again the moral worth you know those kind of people are are good examples once they put you know are are are, are the outcomes of of what is right okay and um, those things that were outlined on the Harvard Project, yeah, were what is right. But then you need a, 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 what he called a theory of right action. And what I'm trying to say is that through a utilitarian framework, you will not get a theory of what is right to, to bring about a multivirate um, phenomena, which is well-being. Right, because because well being being includes all kinds of things, including the people being the kind of you know, people wanting to wanting to have well being, and how are you going to get that through just a system of rules? I mean, if you're just saying, well, the Harvard project is a, an example of what is well being, then I'm saying, yeah, sure. Well, I'll say it again. Um, so the project was pretty clear about what goes into human thriving and how to measure it. Now, you may disagree about uh, utilitarian ethics. You know, you're pretty clear that, yes, we can measure human thriving. And we measure human thriving on the human level. We measure, we measure human thriving uh, based on self-determination based on good health, based on education, based on the ability to choose. These are, these, are, these are things that we do as humans. We don't need to appeal to a supernatural force or angels on our shoulders or demons whispering in our ears. And we don't need perfect exemplars to determine whether an outcome for an individual 
uh, led them to their best potential. So I'm gonna I'm gonna step back. Uh, but but yeah, but we can always ask this question, right? Yeah. We can always ask this question. We do need exemplars. Of all those, th- of all those things that you mentioned, sometimes they go wrong, and pointing to a to a perfect example is is a way to 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 show that that those things need not necessarily go wrong, right? Take for exa- take for example, David throughout. Um, uh, one for the term social cohesion. Would you would you say social cohesion is a necessary component of um, a favourable ethics, Andrew, or do you not want to comment on that? Um, well, let me let me probe it a little bit. I'm happy to comment on it. This is this is a show on ethics, <clears throat> and if it means anything, it should mean that none of us run from it, right? I mean that's the that's the spirit of this thing. So I won't dodge your questions if you don't dodge mine. Uh, okay. I think it's only fair. Um, do I think that social cohesion is necessary? I'd, I'd probably want to ask some questions about social cohesion at what at what kind of scale. Um, so do we need social cohesion at the at sort of the family level or the tribal level or? Uh, you know, some sort of a, of a state or, uh, you know, sort of a national level. Uh, I certainly think that our fabric of, uh, of interpersonal relationships plays a very deep role uh, in our individual mental makeup, how we perceive ourselves, uh, and, and whether we in general have a positive outlook about the future or not. Now, at what level that, you know, what level that scales up to something like, uh, you know, my identity with uh, national politics, I don't know. But uh, yes, at a personal level, our individual relationships, our network of relationships with uh, with friends and family play a critical role. Uh, in who we are and how we get to express ourselves. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to I'm going to jump in right yeah, there. Yeah, I'm not sure what you're saying. There. Yeah, hang, hang, hang on, Marvin. Hang on, Marvin. Yeah. I'm going to jump in right here because this is the time that you told me uh, that you had a, a fairly hard stop. I don't want to let you go without reexamining that. So, do you uh, have some more time to give to the program? I wanted to give you as much uh, time to. Yeah. Um, argue with as many people as possible and I'd be uh, happy to extend your time on the show but I don't want you to uh, miss some critical thing that you need to do so uh, how are you on time yeah I, I do have commitments it's the it's the first day of uh, teaching so I okay. have to so let me get let, off the lesson let me yeah. give you uh, a few minutes to uh, wrap up your last words and uh, the rest of you just hang on the line uh Dale, I don't know if you're still there. I noticed someone looks like we just dropped off. But I want to I want to give Mark, you a chance. Let me, uh, let me just put a bow on that. Uh, Marvin, if that was non-responsive, I'm happy to continue at another time because I don't think I read uh, the part of the conversation where your question to me originally came up, but I'm happy to pick it up and see if we can figure out what the disconnect was. And I've enjoyed okay. it. Okay. Yeah, yeah, me, me too. It was, it was spirited, but... Uh, but fun, huh? Mar- Marvin, who's, who's dropped uh, off? I did enjoy it. I appreciate you. Mar- Marvin, <laughs> Thanks, I, I want you to go ahead and make uh, uh, a closing statement uh, before you go. And uh, you know, if you had some things in your back pocket to say, go ahead and uh, go ahead and get those said now. I think uh, I take I take it that that uh, moral objectivism is the is the better. Um, better option by far I think that's why Vol uh, aims for moral objectivity because you could just can't it, it's, subjectivity is just fraught with with such contradictions and conundrums it makes all kinds of discourse nigh on impossible for example the subjectivist wants to say that um, you know morals are what are applicable to, to that individual, then why are you saying that something that took place in the past is immoral? Right? I think um, 
it's definitely good to have an exemplar because I don't think there's a better way of describing what good is or what sh showing what the ontological basis of what good is. And that's the point. The point is that if you try to explain it, you're just going to end up in a loop of saying, well, it's good because this is good and this is good because this is good. So it's that open question rearing its ugly head again. Um, definitely uh, interest to, to hear some feedback um, with respect to an evolutionary debunking argument, right? An evolutionary debunking argument is that um, we have objective moral belief. That's the first premise. Our faculties are selected to produce adaptive moral belief. Uh, sorry, adaptive belief, not necessarily moral belief. And that adaptive belief could could have been something that we would find completely um, egregious. And since that is the case, it doesn't seem to be that um, evolution could have given us the kind of uh, morals that we have. More likely, it's a special act of creation, and we're a special kind of person or people or creature designed to be the way we are. That's further impacted when you, you look at it that um, humanity is what, 10,000, 12,000 years old in terms of um, uh, mo uh, anatomically modern man's social structures triggered by the Neolithic, um, the Neolithic age. Of course, the Neolithic age is the onset of uh, farming. And once you have the onset of farming, you have a whole different um, met metric of interactions that need to take place. So, um, yeah, that that's what I would want to say. And I'll just just add add, add a question for Val. Um, he he mentioned that um, desirism is the focus of his, um, or let's say it's it's. It fills the good notch, or some people. We would say intrinsic. Uh, actually, Rawls said intrinsic value, but I, I know that Val doesn't like to use the term intrinsic value. He uses good. So since it since it fills the the good in um, Rawls as a theory of examining a moral system of examining a moral theory. I wondered how we would cope with um, desires can sort of be de just don't seem the kind of things upon which we can base de desires. The, there's the ignorance problem, and um, there is the, uh, the the neurosis problem. So that so that means so for example, David, imagine you're a kid, and uh, you were brought up in a in a cult somewhere in 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 Alabama, let's say. And uh, you hated that you hated the cult. It was a religious cult, and you were a preacher in that religious cult. Three jobs came up. None of them are, are, are sort of very fulfilling jobs, right? However, I know you're a clever guy. You applied for one of those jobs, and you got that job. The job would be a button pusher in a lift. Okay, so. Is that is that it's actually fulfilled your desire to become a button pusher, but it's not the way it is filled the desire in a way that we wouldn't necessarily associate with desire fulfillment in a, in a, in a holistic uh, moral sense. So it seems to have some limitations on what de what what desire can do as the placeholder for intrinsic value or good when measuring a moral system. Well, I will make sure that uh, Val uh, speaks to that when he comes on. I can tell you that uh, there have been plenty of times in my life when I would have jumped at the job of button pusher. Uh, uh -huh. We have button pushers today, uh, and they are lift, uh, 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 lift operators. Or elevator operators. But my point is, my point is, you're a clever guy, and uh, I there think, are the, uh, well, being, now let's being, let's being not a, impugn a, the, let's not being, impugn being, the cleverness being, of lift operators. There are plenty being, of lift operators a, who are probably 
writing some of the world's greatest poetry uh, with it's part of their mind while they are yeah. uh, earning money pushing buttons. It's a very clever job to do if you want to do something easy while doing yeah. something uh, else with your mind that's uh, profitable. Now, you can't very well do got, that I've got it. I've if got you're it. an ambulance I've got driver, it. for instance. Got it. And Philip, Philip Glass, one of my favorite composers, was composing some of his best work when he was a taxi driver. So we get that. It's not to denigrate the job. It's just to say that given how you have located your, given how the subject of that thought experiment has located themselves or is located, then it doesn't seem to, and the, you're still pushing buttons in, in a commune that you don't want to be in, doesn't seem to be fulfilling your desire. There's ignorance, and there's an ignorance of other facts that actively weigh to your desire, really being the desire that is not the desire that would fulfill your desire the most, or be the thing that you want to do the most. That's the point of the thought experiment. Yeah, well, like I said, I'll uh, I'll be sure to ask Val to uh, <laughs> fill, yeah. it, fill in um, the gaps that my... Uh, lack of cleverness uh, can can feel right now because I'm not entirely sure I understand why that's a conundrum. Um, but then again, I've had a lot of jobs that were worse than button pusher, so maybe maybe that's contributing to my lack of imagination. Um, so at any rate, I I thank you uh, for that. Uh, was there anything else that you would like to uh, add before you uh, head off to your teaching responsibilities? No, thank you very much, gentlemen. Pleasure. Okay, and this is not uh, uh, David. 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 Yes. I, David. I'd like to. I'd like to say goodbye real quick. Marvin, it was a real pleasure uh, speaking to you. Uh, in a spirit of morality, I hope we can have a good relationship going forward, despite some of our clashes in the past. I really, I really got a chance to to learn more about you on this call, and I, and I hope for the same for you. Yes, totally. Uh, totally agreed. Thank you very much, Brian. I, I appreciate and. You know, now we have sort of connected a relationship and it will be much better, I'm sure. Absolutely. <laughs> Buy a condios, my friend. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm hoping, Marvin, that you will agree to be a regular on the show uh, in season <laughs> three. I'm, I'm sure the fans will demand it. We, uh, we must do what you've they got, demand. You've got, a great, you've got a great voice for radio, Marvin. Drink some honey tea and keep, keep good care of it. Yeah, thank you so much. What, what was the one there? What was the one um, that I used before? My my friend told me, Marvin, you've got the face for radio. <laughs> <laughs> well, we we've we've got your picture uh, right up there, front and center, on the top of the blog. You you've got a face for video too. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Late thank night, you, late late night video, uh, to be sure. Um, <laughs> not not daytime stuff, but uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, so um, Brian, I, I, I just <laughs> apologize to Andrew if I come across a bit too rowdy. Pleasure speaking to Andrew as well. Uh, hey, Marvin. Everybody comes across <laughs> to I Andrew like it. that. I, uh, Marvin, I enjoyed it, and I hope we get a chance to talk some more. Um, spirited conversation, uh, spirited conversation, shouldn't be a barrier to, uh, you know, to reaching out and caring about what happens to each other. So I do appreciate the conversation and I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I appreciate Bye. it.